This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Today we're going to talk about the convergence of a series that I think is like quite aesthetically pleasing. And it's the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n factorial times the sine of n. And really two things are apparent in this series that are pulling it in two different directions. One towards convergence and one towards divergence. So the, the immediate thought upon looking at this is that n factorial is in the denominator. And n factorial grows very, very quickly, so this thing must converge. But then if you think a little bit more, you see that if n is close to an integer multiple of pi, then, well, sine of n is pretty close to zero because sine has zeros at integers, integer multiples of pi and thus one over sine is very, very, very large. And by large, I mean either positively large or negatively large. Okay, so how can we maybe uncover the convergence of this series? Well, we're gonna have to look at something called the irrationality measure, or I guess it's probably a irrationality measure as there are probably more than one of these. And this is taken from MathWorld at wolfram.com. So here we go. So for a real number x, let's consider the following set. So it's the set of all real numbers, which I'll call mu, where the absolute value of x minus p over q is between 0 and 1 over q to the mu for all rational numbers p and q. And then what we'll do is define mu of x to be the infimum of this set, which we've defined and called A. And let's recall that the infimum is the so-called greatest lower bound, which means, well, exactly what it sounds like. It's a lower bound of the set and the greatest such of all of the lower bounds. So in other words, mu of x is less than or equal to alpha for all alpha in A. So that would be being a lower bound. And then if we have another lower bound, which I've called beta, so beta is less than or equal to alpha, then beta must be less than or equal to mu of x. So beta is smaller than our greatest lower bound. Okay, so equivalent to this definition is the following definition, which will be more helpful for our investigation of this series. And that is that there exists some natural number n such that if p and q are bigger than or equal to n, then for all epsilon bigger than zero, we have the absolute value of x minus p over q is greater than or equal to one over q to the mu x plus epsilon, where the mu x is this thing up here. Okay. So now that we've seen this definition for this measurement of irrationality, let's look at this measurement for a couple of well-known irrational numbers. Before we continue, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Squarespace. Are you ready to take your online presence to the next level? Look no further than Squarespace. Squarespace is a service that takes the hassle out of creating a website. Choose from a vast library of professionally designed templates that are not only visually stunning, but also fully customizable to reflect your unique style and brand. The new Fluid Engine gives you complete control over the structure of your website. Squarespace's intuitive drag and drop builder allows you to create and edit your website effortlessly. No technical skills required. Your website will look and function flawlessly on any device. Use Squarespace's analytics to measure your website's performance and make informed decisions for growth. I use Squarespace for my website and find it easy to use with plenty of integrations. They even have a plugin for LaTeX that allows me to include equations on my website very easily. Whether you need a place to sell your merch or show your art, Squarespace has the tools that you need to keep your website modern and easy to use. Give Squarespace a try by going to squarespace.com slash michaelpin to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Use code michaelpin. Thanks again for Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so let's look at the irrationality measure of, well, first of all, a whole class of numbers and then some well-known transcendental numbers. So mu of x is in fact equal to one if x is a rational number, but I think that's pretty clear because in that case, we can always make this equal to zero. 
Okay, and then it's equal to two if we have an irrational number that's algebraic. For instance, the square root of two or the golden ratio phi. And this was actually really hard. In fact, Roth earned the Fields Medal for this proof. And then if x is a transcendental number, then mu of x is bigger than or equal to two. So let's look at some examples. So here we've got x, an upper bound for mu of x, and then where it was first proven. So if we have pi, then the upper bound for mu of x, in other words, the largest mu of x could be, is 7.10320534. And this is by Zailberger and Zudlin, and this was from 2020. And in fact, the irrationality measure of pi is related to a really famous series. In particular, if someone proves that mu of pi is less than or equal to 2.5, then the famous Flint Hill series, which is the sum of 1 over n cubed times sine squared of n, actually converges. So it's maybe thought that this does converge, but it would rely on actually a pretty big decrease in the upper bound for mu of pi. Okay, so here are some others. So the irrationality measure of E is two. Well, the upper bound for it is two, but notice the smallest it can be is also two. So that means it has to be equal to two. And then here's one for the natural log of two and one for the zeta function evaluated at three. And I guess I should say here that I would have liked to prove at least this irrationality measure for pi, but it turns out that it's quite hard. The earliest proof for, well, not this upper bound, but for an upper bound, which I think was like 42, is still very technical. So we'll actually just use this result in order to determine if this converges or diverges. Okay, so now that we've got the requisite background information, let's jump into our investigation of this series. Okay, so now we're going to look at our problem, and this is based on something that I found on the Math Stack Exchange. Okay, so let's recall that we had this upper bound of 7.1 and so on as mu of pi. So that means mu of pi must be less than or equal to that. But let's recall by one of our equivalent definitions for the irrationality measure, what does that mean? So that means that there must exist some natural number n so that if p and q are both bigger than or equal to n, then for all epsilon bigger than zero, we have the absolute value of pi minus p over q is bigger than or equal to one over q to the mu of pi plus epsilon. Okay, nice. So now the idea here is just to choose epsilon so that we can change this mu of pi plus epsilon to something nice. And we can really choose epsilon to be anything we want that's bigger than zero. So we might as well choose this epsilon so that when we add it to mu of pi, we get the number eight. Just because, you know, that's the closest natural number bigger than seven, so it is easy to work with. Okay, so that's the nice inequality that we have at the moment. So let's put a box around that. So let's just reiterate what we have. So we've got a natural number n, so that if p and q are bigger than or equal to that natural number, then pi minus p over q in absolute values is bigger than or equal to q to the eight, is bigger than or equal to one over q to the eight. And then I guess we don't need this for all epsilon bigger than zero because we use that to build this construction. So now we're gonna introduce some new things and they are the following. So the first is a fact. It's really an inequality that a sine function must satisfy. And I think it's pretty easy to prove, so we won't prove it. And that is the absolute value of sine of x is in fact bigger than or equal to the absolute value of x over two. So I won't prove that, but that is a fact. And then also we're gonna set q sub n equal to the closest integer to the number n over pi. So q sub n clearly depends on n because for instance, the closest integer to 
1 million over pi is going to be totally different than the closest integer to 3 over pi. And now we're going to use those two things in the following calculation to get us started. So let's write this. So we've got the absolute value of sine of n is the same thing as the absolute value of sine of n minus q sub n times pi. Well, and that's just by the two pi periodicity of sine. Well, notice if q of n is even, then these two are equal even without the absolute value. If q sub n is odd, then these differ just by a sign, so their absolute value is the same. Okay, so now we have this set up. Let's apply our inequality that we have. So this is bigger than or equal to, I'm gonna maybe write this as one half times the absolute value of n minus q sub n times pi. Or actually, I'm gonna move the pi to one side. So we have q sub n times pi minus n. And now, next up, I'll factor q to the n out of the absolute value. So that'll leave me with q sub n, I should say, over two times the absolute value of pi minus n over q sub n. But now let's notice that we can apply our inequality like this right here to get the following. So this is gonna be bigger than or equal to q sub n over two. And then, like I said, by our irrationality measure inequality, we can replace this object with one over q sub n to the eight power. And then this is equal to one over two times q sub n to the seventh power. But of course, that's not true for all values of n and q sub n. That only occurs when n and q sub n are both bigger than or equal to our number capital N. So we've got to keep that in mind. Okay, so let's see where we go from there. So here's where we are so far. We've got the absolute value of sine of n is bigger than or equal to one over two times q to the n to the seventh power when q sub n and n are both bigger than or equal to that natural number capital N that we brought into existence earlier. And then let's maybe also recall how q sub n was defined because that's gonna be pretty important. So q sub n is closest integer to the number n over pi. And so that fact is gonna allow us to get a handle on the size of q sub n. So let's maybe see how that works. So again, the fact that q sub n is the closest integer to n over pi tells us that q sub n is bound below by n over pi minus one half and it's bound above by n over pi plus one half. And now we're gonna employ a well-worn trick and that's to add zero, but add zero in the right form. So here I'm going to add n over three and I'll also subtract n over three. And then the trick is to write this maybe nicely. And in fact, we'll write it like this. n over three plus one half and then minus the quantity one third minus one over pi times n. But if we step back a little bit, we'll notice that if all of this stuff that's kind of at the tail here were gone, then we would have this nice inequality deposited towards us. Notice we would have q sub n is less than or equal to n over three. That's like a direct comparison between q sub n and n over three. Okay, so let's see how we can get there. So I'm gonna write it like this. So let's note q sub n is less than or equal to n over three if and only if we have one half minus one third minus one over pi times n is bigger than or equal to zero. Because that means that we're getting rid of something positive. But then after doing some calculations to get n by itself, you'll see that this is equivalent to n being bigger than or equal to the following number. So it'll be three pi over two pi minus, and in fact, that is larger than 33. And that actually sets us up for our final argument. So let's make that. So we have the following. So if n is bigger than or equal to the maximum of four times capital N 
and 34. So why the four times capital N? Well, notice if N is bigger than or equal to four times capital N by this lower bound here for Q sub N, that'll most definitely put our Q sub N larger than our capital N. So that means our lowercase N and our Q sub N will be bigger than or equal to that capital N. And then why the 34? Well, because if N is bigger than or equal to 34, then we can use the fact that Q sub N is less than or equal to little n over three, which was important. Okay, so now we have that set up. We can see that the sine of n, or the absolute value of the sine of n, which earlier we showed was bigger than or equal to one over two times q sub n to the seven. Using this right here, we can rewrite that inequality so it only depends on n. So that'll be bigger than or equal to three to the seven over two times one over n to the seven. But then pushing this forwards to something a little bit more useful for our purposes, we'll see that this inequality is equivalent to saying that one over n factorial times the absolute value of sine of n is in fact less than or equal to two times n to the seven over three to the seven times n factorial. But then also we can show the following series converges. So it'll be the sum as n goes from one to infinity of n to the seven over n factorial converges. I think that's pretty clear. You could use standard methods from calculus too to do that. But then all of our terms are positive. That's because n factorial is always positive and then we have an absolute value there, which means our series in fact absolutely. Okay, so there we've done it. We've answered the question. So we've determined that the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over n factorial times sine of n absolutely converges. And while this series is easy to write down and very easy to understand, we had to use some pretty heavy machinery to get here. And that brings me to a question for you. Do you know of any series that are really easy to write down and really easy to understand, but require really heavy machinery to decide if they converge or diverge? Maybe post them in the comments. And if you're still here and you haven't subscribed, consider subscribing, it would really help us out. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.